clean up after yourselves. After yourselves. This is one of the talks I've been looking forward to most because I um, celebrated this project a lot over the past year. Who of you heard about Open Shufa? That's why you're here. Yeah, exactly. Nearly all of you. And who helped? With open, open Schufa. Quite a few. Finde ich total großartig. Vielleicht können wir You're great. Um, maybe we can reverse engineer that damned algorithm. Anna is working on it with his uh, people. And the second thing I uh, really liked was uh, often exits are open laws. Suddenly there's a, there's a portal that uh, has all the federal law. Genau so fand ich das. And that's exactly what also, I thought of that. Machen wir schnell jetzt. Der nächste Talk, Court the in the Akten. Talk, Court in the Akten, from, uh, with Stefan Wehrmeier, Weimar Palmetshofer and Arne Sem Semsroth. Ja, uh, guten Morgen. Good morning. Nice to see so many of you so early in the morning for our talk, uh, Caught in the Acton, uh, a title that uh, I'm probably the only one in finding really amusing. Well, one more person over there. Never mind. We're going to be giving a short talk on applied hacker ethics and uh, on uh, especially the part about using uh, protecting private data and using open or public data and we have two project projects that uh, use this in very different ways both of them are about private companies that act as if they were government agencies um, but not not when it comes to transparency but in everything else and we tried two different approaches to crack these companies. We'll start with Open Shufa, and uh, after that we uh, will talk about uh, Offen Gesetze, and then we should have some uh, time for discussion. Open data with the, the Shufa credit rating, rating agency is a difficult topic. Shufa has data on almost 70 million people in Germany. And some of their information is very sensitive because it's financial data and uh, missed payments on uh, lots of people, probably most of you in this room. And people who don't have a lot, of, lot to do with Schufa actually tend to think that it's a government agency, but it's a, it's a private company that doesn't publish uh, its algorithms. People talk about the, the, their scores that are supposed to calculate the probability of uh, somebody um, paying back a loan. There's only, there's not just one Shufa score for each person, there are about 16 of them. But the way they, um, they calculate these scores is a company secret. Um, this was upheld in the courts as well and Schufa doesn't need to um, publish the way they calculate these scores. But they can't stop people from reverse engineering these uh, these scores we, and that's what we tried with Open Schufa, which is a problem, uh, which is a project of uh, Open Knowledge Foundation and Algorithm Watch and its goal is to reverse engineer the Schufa algorithm. We uh, started a crowdfunding uh, early this year. Many of you supported it uh, and donated. Thank you very much. That uh, allowed us to start this work. We had a had an advertising spot for which we could uh, where we could convince um, the very nice Z uh, Nico Zemsrot to um, appear. And the idea was and still is that everyone can request their own personal data after uh, with uh, under under GDPR and receive them by mail we then scan them and anonym, um, redact them and people can then donate them to us many people did so on uh, selbstauskunft.net they requested their private data and then donated them to us the Schufa wasn't exactly happy about this project. 
Very early in this crowdfunding, they uh, added a huge banner to their website where they said that it's misleading and uh, damaging to uh, security and uh, privacy in Germany. That was great of them. Thank you very much for that, Schufa. Because they had a huge banner on their homepage, Open Schufa, the link to us, and they gave us a lot of traffic. That was really brilliant. Schufa was very unwilling to cooperate throughout the process. There were lots of journalists who tried to uh, research individual cases and uh, to confront Schufa with them. And this is uh, a report from a journalist at the Welt newspaper who um, showed how Schufa um, talks to journalists because they uh, exert a lot of pressure on journalists. They try to prevent uh, reporting at the very last second. Uh, they um, they uh, say that they're spreading fake news and this shows quite nicely that uh, Schufa has a lot of lot to hide. And uh, what we could uh, bring to the public is uh, what Walter is now going to tell you. Okay, so we essentially started to collect the data in May, um, um, just and basically to implement this idea, um, protect private data, use public data. In this case, we need essentially private data um, to get to data that should be public or to reverse engineer this data structure of data that should be public, in our opinion. In total, um, there, uh, there are 100,000 requests to these uh, scoring rating companies. Um, there isn't just Schufa in Germany. We emphasize that. Um, repeatedly, there are other companies that use even worse data sets um, and that are even w l less well known. But we're always saying we'll start with Schufa, but it's not going to stop there. The really nice thing is in other countries it's called my data. We'd like to call it our data because we want people to know that what, what this data is and that you can actually donate it and that, that you can contribute this to a pool that can be used for the public good and where we can essentially find out more. Um, so, over a half a year, we got um, 3,000 data donations and we had one problem um, that when people asked for uh, their, their their data from Schufa, then they got a piece of paper, they got it by letter, um, then they had to scan it and send it to us. Um, and so the, a lot of data is lost because uh, maybe the scan quality is bad. So that was the first challenge that you have a switch from one medium to the next. And then there's a break between data because the very simple thing is that the people who participated um, are on average probably um, above uh, and different from the societal average. There were a lot of men. Um, it was generally young people who were very urban, who were interested in technology. So the sample really, really isn't perfect. Um, and on May 25th this year, there the GDPR was implemented. And from that point onward, the Schufa published less data. That's kind of funny, because if there's a single company that should have prepared itself for GDPR, then it sh would have been this one company. It's one of the main companies that has personal data um, and has all this data about every si single person. Um, and yeah, not private people should be upset, but this company should be prepared. And that's probably be also because the Data Protection Commissioner there didn't think about it enough. Um, Schufa basically had seven months um, where they just didn't uh, send out data that they should have given out. That really was a problem because we got fewer pieces of information or couldn't use all of these data points that we had. But So the sample that we have isn't really representative. And um, the aim would have been to have 3,000 3, perfect data sets and could have essentially model and emulate the, this, uh, this Schufa algorithm. And so that's what this looked like before GDPR, if you requested your data. So you see you're the scores for different sectors. And then after May 25th, it was slightly less. 
Um, so one thing that we tried to figure out, what, the, what are hard factors? So there are several, the different variables, there are several outliers here that I want to emphasize. Um, one is when someone has declared bankruptcy. The other one is um, if uh, your uh, the things you own are uh, are seized by the government to essentially pay for your um, for things for money that you owe. Um, so these are two things. That's where you're essentially where your credit score goes far down very quickly. In these cases, it actually makes sense. Uh, so. 95% of the score basically affect three quarters of people. Um, and there's basically, based on this data, they decide whether you can get a smartphone contract. But so the variables that they use to make to calculate these scores are pretty vague in our opinion. And we also assume that there are problems with incorrect data. For, for example, there are bad scores without any negative markers that affected 20 people who got a negative score but didn't have any negative data. Um, if you calculate that up uh, for the entire German population, that would affect a lot of people. Um, but also, if you, for example, get a bad score and that affects your credit, then you might not think of even not even think of this because you have done everything right, and you might not think of the fact that maybe they made a mistake. There are also allegedly um, cases where there are an, where there is a number of people that have fewer than three data points. So this is a I'd say this is a very uh, thin soup, and. Uh, the third part is that there are different versions of these uh, scores. There's a version 1, version 2, version 3. Nobody really knows which bank requests which version and what that means. So there's a, there's a discrepancy between these uh, score values. And I think these versions very nicely show what happens in the background because there are companies who uh, collect these data that are then that are used in the scoring they send it to Schufa they um, use their non-official model and then uh, a third party uses them and use the score to uh, deny something to the consumer it's this chain of people who say that they simply collect the data and don't actually use it and say that they um, uh, they who, who don't really want to uh, publish how they uh, how they calculated their scores and this is one of the large problems if there happens anything if, if anything goes wrong in the chain because, for example people who uh, if, if uh, companies fail to report that people paid back their loans then um, the system thinks that the loan is still uh, still go, um, still in force and uh, people can then be denied further loans and um, nobody nobody can uh, really find out what what causes this uh, who who uh, what link um, which part of the chain caused uh, caused this uh, caused this error there are also the uh, variables of age and gender and uh, moving house um, there's there are things that indicate uh, that, um, for example, younger people or men uh, have uh, lower scores, and also the number of of, uh, of house removals uh, affects your score. So people who move more often have uh, lower scores. But there are people who are forced to move house, for example, to, for, because they have to run away from something worse. and. These people can't can't uh, can't prove that their removals were justified because they, for example, had to move to Bavaria. Although that's uh, that's uh, really bad luck. And uh, another nice finding is we see three patterns here. On the left-hand side, you see the number of credit cards, the number of bank accounts, and the number of mobile contracts. And you can uh, see that the peak is always at the number two. So if you have two credit cards, two bank accounts, and uh, two uh, phone contracts, then your score is likely to be very high. I would, of course, never claim that uh, you can game the score, but uh, two seems to be better than one. But 
Um, for example, if you're moving house only temporarily, you maybe shouldn't uh, register with the offices. Um, on the 30th of October, the Council of Experts uh, of the Ministry of Justice published uh, a report on uh, consumer scoring where they said that uh, the, uh, the algorithm has to be opened up, at least partially. And uh, their claims were furthered by uh, publications from the Bavarian uh, public broadcaster and Spiegel Online. And uh, Schufa, of course, responded with a nine-page letter that uh, people were not allowed to quote. The Ministry, Minister of uh, Justice Bali also um, wanted uh, more transparency from Schufa. And this led to um, led to the promise of uh, electronic requests, the data requests, where people will be sent a code by letter that can that they can then use online uh, to request their data online. So if uh, this works one time, you could probably uh, create a, an account where people can do so regularly and uh, correct where people can correct their own data. And that's what we want. We want transparency on how these scores are calculated, how certain things affect the score, and uh, that you can perhaps get notifications that, uh, that tell people that they got a negative scores so that they know about it and have a chance to correct them because this t usually takes months of hard work to to get companies to um, to correct any mistakes they may have made in this entire process. These are the things we are hoping for in future. We say that Chufa is only the beginning and not the end. And we want to show what people can do when they share data and when they uh, understand what it means when they give us their private financial data. Um, okay, so the question is, the Shufa doesn't simply publish all the data that they have about one individual, but they publish data that they give others. Um, and we actually think that according to DP, GDPR, the Shufa actually should be, should be publishing much more giving out much more information and we want to force them to give out more information uh, more of the information that they have essentially saved about you um, so that's also one way of doing this is that we want to sue them one thing that was also really important is that minister barley also demanded this we hope that that's going to lead to something um, because this is going to be a law in an ideal case um, in that case this um, law would basically be published in the federal gaze law gazette right yeah okay And so we have some pre something prepared for this as well. Yes, um, open laws or often a gesetze. We already said in the beginning laws. Where do you find them? If you look for a law online, then you can find it on different websites. For example, De Jure or Busa. Um, or our the official website is called Laws on the Internet, which is really important because otherwise you don't know where you're putting that URL in. Um, and you can find every single law on there um, and every uh, official guidance. And it's pretty current, but sometimes it takes a few days for the current version to be on there. But how does the law actually get to that place, to that point where it's published? And so I've um, made a quick graphic because usually um, if you look for how our law is implemented and decided on, you find weird flowcharts. I try to turn this into a Git remote process and present it as such. So you know, well, this is what it looks like. Um, so there's one branch from the ministries. So they basically get um, a draft um, that gets to the government, that decides on it in the cabinet, then it goes to parliament, then it goes to the, um, uh, it's to the second chamber which has the federal state uh, representatives in it. And then once it's agreed on in Parliament, then the government 
German government signs it again. So basically they're doing git sign. Then it goes to the German president who also has to sign it. And then it goes into the production re release branch, Germany, Federal Republic of Germany. Um, and it's going get, it gets merged in there and then it basically is put in place. So only once it's on the production release branch is it actually a law that is in force before that it does, that hasn't actually happened. But the question is, where is this production release branch? Where is essentially Git, the Git log for this? Um, and the log for this is um, the federal is the federal law gazette, um, also known as BGBL, which shouldn't be confused with the German law book. Um, basically, this is where laws are announced, um, and it's the gazette gazette where these are promulgated. Um, there is a weird distinction between two German words here that is not relevant for the English translation. Um, but the thing is that these laws are basically published and actually printed out um, in this Gazette. This was the first federal law Gazette um, of the Fed Federal Republic of Germany in 1949, where they basically pu where they actually published the basic law, the German Constitution. Unfortunately, it looks exactly the same in the year 2018. For example, here, this is an example. Um, this is uh, the law that legalized same-sex marriage. Um, that is a so-called article law. Um, and these article laws that are published in this gazette change existing laws. So it's basically a patch. So if you look at this, um, you, it basically tells you that the current, that the, that the existing law is changed in such and such a way. It tells you that paragraph one. 1,309 is changed um, and then essentially the wording is changed that um, marriage can be between two people rather than between a man and a woman. I personally think it's super complicated to read. I have no idea what the context for this whole thing is and what I know is this, right? On the right side, then you can see what was added, what was taken out. But the problem is that it has to be readable by people and doesn't have to be readable by machines. Um, open laws, our project was more concerned with uh, legal problems, but if you, there are also technical problems, right? Because if you look for this website f that publishes these things for the Gazette, then you get this website, very nice, very 2000. And if you look at this a bit closely, more closely, you see this publishing company here, Bundesanzeiger. Um, what is this publishing company? It's a private publishing company now. It used to be owned by the government, but what was privatized in the 80s um, initially. And then in 2006, it was completely privatized and be, is part of uh, Dumont Media Group. You may have heard about them. They published several newspapers um, in Berlin and Cologne, all very high quality papers. Um, and so this media group basically also publishes our laws. So if you kind of click a bit further on the website, then you can find the free citizen access. Oh, free citizen access. Well, I love that. I click on there and then I get this big green box. With a, war with a warning. And it basically says the electronic version of the federal law gazettes um, is basically an intellectual property protection. So basically this media company uh, says that they have intellectual property rights to laws of the Federal Republic of Germany. But basically every law is a public agency piece of work that is not protected intellectually. But the collection of these laws, you could say that there is an IP claim there, and they're definitely laying the claim to these laws here. It's very obvious they're putting that right on there, right on top, um, and they're laying claim to this particular IP right. Um, if you try to click a bit further and go look into these gazettes, you realize there is no search function. There is no OCR of PDFs before 1998. They're, they're just pictures. Um, the PDFs are basically with copy and uh, uh, protected, quote unquote, against copy and paste and printing them out. We may know how to get rid of those, but I guess the regular user who might just want to copy and paste something from there, um, some PDF readers might say, well, you can't do that, you have to put in a password. Of course, that's stupid. Um, and then the pages themselves, actually, where you have a law on a page, they include ads um, in the footer. And then it, for example, says things 
things like, oh, you can go onto this web website where you can look at all of these things, where essentially this private company is using this the laws that they're publishing to advertise their own products. I think that's kind of inappropriate, and it's not actually related to the lawmaking process itself. But, of course, you can also access this in a different way, um, because you can essentially get a subscription for a half year it costs you just it'll cost you just 99 euros um, and then suddenly all of these documents can be printed um, you can take out pieces of text so it's basically copy and paste um, you can also get this as an email you'll get it via newsletter um, and so also when you're getting it via email the subscription subscription actually costs 108 euros for six months one thing we also wanted to know is how did this publishing company get to publish all of these things um, get to and um, was privatized and so we tried to get this contract um, you can find this request on Frag den Staat and it's quite interesting because there's a lot blacked out here so I would say maybe 50% we appealed this but that's currently going on but the justification for this blacking blacking out for these blacked out places was that it said this includes when the contract went into force and until when it's in force and how this I, and what the position of these laws is in terms of ip law so we couldn't even figure that out from this contract because the ministry blacked it out and then they basically said there is an interest in keeping this secret because it could influence the economic situation of this publishing company and that's why it had to be blacked out our reaction is these was these um, federal law gazettes was to publish these federal law gazettes on offenegazette.de, which is a German website where these things are published um, and means open laws. Um, we did that with uh, Johannes, um, Anne, and I. We did that together. That's a pretty nice website. You can search them. You can download them. They're text versions. Um, and so the Ministry of Justice can find it as well. We also f published it on the internet, so we don't just have openlaws.de, we also have openlaws in the internet, on the internet.de. So this is the startup page, the, the, the a comparison of the features that we have. The free citizen access you can they can print it you can't search it we we actually have text versions of older versions as well as well we basically have these for versions across years we have these for different for different versions if you download these gigabytes of pdfs and you want to use them do that we think these are public data you can do that we also have stable links um the other version unfortunately doesn't have stable links to pdfs all of these are session links so you can't even give a link to someone we have rss feeds um, and of course everything is free thank you The, the reaction was pretty positive. Reactions were pretty positive. Like here, thank you. Um, and the legal community also reacted in a very positive way. So law professors essentially wrote blog posts about this and were like, "Oh, this is great." Apparently, there was a lot of um, this ha hadn't been moving forward for several years. So this legal community was very happy and positive about this as well. And now, um, Minister of Justice uh, Bali also said that she will take this federal law gazette away from the Dumont publishing company, at least that's what one newspaper titles puts in their headline. Um, an electronic version of this has been in the planning for a while, but which is currently only envisioned to go to start being published in 2021. And so at that point, it only has to be published online anymore. But the thing that was new is that even the previous federal law gazettes should be put online and should be searchable for free by the government. So now the government is essentially taking charge of this and that I think is definitely improvement and I hope we contributed to that to um, actually finally implement this decision. And one thing that's also interesting is the company Juris is the first co company that retweeted this tweet and they do a something similar but not with laws but with uh, court decisions um, which is also a company that maybe we should have a look at, should have a look at sometime. So how is this going to continue? We're waiting for a lawsuit. Actually, we're not that 
Um, we're not that certain because we don't think we did anything wrong, but we will see how this continues. Sorry. Um, maybe we already have something in our ma mailbox. We are going to continue cleaning up this gazette a bit. Um, we, for example, noticed that some of their meta metadata on their website are incorrect. For example, uh, dates are corrupted and are impossible to parse. And of course, um, there are loads of other gazettes in Germany. For example, the uh, Ministerial Gazette, which is also very important for uh, the federal government. But there are many other levels that have their own gazettes. For example, uh, the federal states or, but, or the municipalities. And and many of these are probably in the hands of private uh, publishing companies. Many of them are publicly available, but um, many others are, uh, only have paid access. And we should uh, continue to strive for um, availability here, and you can uh, help with that. So that was uh, Open Schufa and Offene Gesetze. Both of these are projects by Open Knowledge Foundation. And we try to we try to break these uh, rules that uh, these ancient companies are trying to impose on us, both uh, Schufa and um, the, uh, the, the publishing company of the Federal Gazettes are ancient companies and uh, they've always uh, done things the way they do now, but um, we're, we're trying to uh, see what we can change. In anderen Räumen waren die immer schon an. Um, in other rooms, uh, these mi mics were usually on already. Thanks for this talk. It was very interesting. Um, I just joined y'all. We have a few minutes for Q&A. Please go to the microphones. Mic two, please. Um, in the beginning or in the middle of the year, someone said that the entire business model of Schufa is basically affected by GDPR or could be affected by GDPR, the general data protection ru rules for Europe. I was didn't follow this. Has anything come of that? Has some has a data commissioner said everything's fine or what's the status quo there? Schufa still exists. The person in, or the person in charge is the uh, data protection officer for the federal state of Hess. He's um, not pursuing uh, Schufa as much as he ought to. If it were in a different state, things might look differently. But um, the one change that happened is this uh, electronic data request. Previously, they only sent things by mail, but um, they assured the data protection com commissioner that they'll be using uh, email or will be sending uh, access codes by mail and uh, you can then request or fetch your data online. That is one thing that has changed, but we haven't really heard about any uh, anything else the federal, uh, the data protection officer might, uh, might be objecting to. And, uh, the business model of Schufa is of course not uh, charging people for accessing their own data, it's uh, selling that data on to uh, other companies. Microphone two again, please. Um, I wanted to ask about the state of play, whether you're still collecting data for Open Schufa. Due to these uh, very, uh, very um, shortened data requ uh, replies people are getting, there's not much point. These are often shorter than one line and that's not data that we can usefully uh, use in our in our model so we've currently put things on hold but we hope that if we uh, if we exert more pressure on Schufa and get nice long replies then we can use that data again but of course we we hope that uh, the uh, the Ministry of Justice intervenes and all of this is pointless anyway um hi I also have a question for the makers of open Schufa and you have a lot of information there now um, you have gotten a lot of important, sensitive personal data, and then GDPR also went into effect. And I wanted to ask whether how you dealt with GDPR and having to be GDPR compliant. 
We had uh, legal aid. The data are only given to two external media companies and the rest was uh, dealt with internally at the Open Knowledge Foundation and Algorithm Watch. The data protection officer Nico Herting did all this. We weren't interested in people, people's names. They were not usually included unless they uh, made a mistake, unless people made a mistake when they uploaded their data where and uh, included easily identifiable data. So ideally we don't have that data at all. But of course that doesn't mean that, that uh, the, these uh, data sheets are completely anonymous. Of course there are certain ways to um, to uh, find out who actually owned these data or who these data are about. We don't publish them though. Many uh, many people told us that they would like to work with our data set, but we uh, currently don't allow that with uh, our data. We have a question from the internet. Signal Angel, please. Um, are you planning to publish these laws as code patch versions, and are you working on a machine-readable version of these laws? We've been focusing on the uh, on the legal issues here. There's a project. There was a project called uh, Federal Git that tried to version the federal laws on GitHub. This um, I, I did that myself, <laughs> and there was a lot of manual work involved in reverse engineering how these uh, how these uh, uh, are made. And uh, we we had a legal work, legal hack workshop here at one of the assemblies. And we try to see if uh, these uh, patches can be extracted from the Federal Law Gazette using natural language parsing and uh, taking apart the PDFs and finding out which paragraph was changed in which way. But um, there are lots of different ways uh, that these changes can be uh, can be included in the in the Federal Law Gazette. There are there are services that do that, for example, Booza, but. It's complicated. It's a very complicated matter. There's a lot of work involved. And ideally, we wouldn't have to reverse engineer this like we do with OpenShufa. But we'd like to uh, have the legislator do, th do that himself. And that would also simplify the uh, legal process where people currently type everything into Word documents. And instead of changing uh, laws directly and versioning them, we have these laws that change other laws. We hope that this is going to change, but um, the uh, legal experts I've talked to don't uh, see any changes here in the near future. There's not a lot of progress unless we do it ourselves, but that's a lot of work. But we're not the only ones who hate this way of changing things. Also, um, the, the governments hate these. There's essentially nobody who uh, really likes this uh, old way of doing things. There's a <laughs> there's a new project called e-legislation, and uh, it's a federal project that, uh, that tries to work on this. But I think it's mainly about uh, writing a word plugin. <laughs> Super. Microphone number two. Great. Micro microphone number two, please. Yeah, I'm interested in where this data and these laws come from that ended up on openlaws.de. Did someone basically scrape them by hand from this citizen access and then OCR the ones that haven't been OCR'd yet? And did you get rid of the advertisements? There's now no no more advertising included, but um, we can't really tell you where it comes from now. We have time for one more question. Microphone one, please. Hi, great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I was in the lightning talks just now and heard of a project that is interested in um, publishing court decisions. Are you have you heard of that or do you work with those? Open legal data. Yeah. Fortunately, in this area, there are some very cool people. 
who are trying to not only publish laws but also court orders and we are trying to find out how we can get ourselves sued there. Well, thank you again. Please give the speakers another warm round of applause.